Here we go. It's Law and Gospel on this October the 4th in the year of our Lord 2023. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and it's a Wednesday, which means we're going to be taking a look at a portion of Proverbs. Proverbs 25, beginning with verse 15. And this is entitled, Advice for Kings and Leaders. Now, this is advice from God. It's through the author Solomon, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to give us insight into how God says we ought to behave, how we ought to act. And so verse 25 Uh, chapter 25, verse 15 says, with patience, a ruler may be persuaded and a soft tongue will break a bone. Now, what does that mean? One of the things I said this a number of times in going through the book of Proverbs is I read the passage, it's in the English, I don't have any understanding of what God is referring to. Now, the first part isn't too bad. With patience, a ruler may be persuaded. What what God is saying is, if there is a ruler or a leader in the country or in the church, and you disagree with what the leader or ruler is saying, then you approach him with patience. You don't go to him and yell to him, boy, you're wrong, you need to change. No, you explain it to him and with patience try and have a conversation that is mature, and then you'll be able to persuade the ruler. Because if the person you're trying to persuade gets the impression that you don't think much of them, then it's going to be hard for you to persuade them in your way of thinking. But what's this second part? And a soft tongue will break a bone. Now, we realize that the mouth of a lion is very powerful. It can break bones. How does a soft tongue break a bone? Well, if we take a look at the word soft, it's really referring to a loving tongue is more powerful than a lion. Break a bone means that you'll get your point across to the person with whom you disagree. This is great advice. Solomon, of course, is talking a lot to his son throughout the book of Proverbs. And parents, when they have a disobedient child, you can break their behavior with a soft tongue. Can you imagine a parent saying to a child, boy, I regret the day that you were born. That is not a soft tongue. A soft tongue instead would say, I really love you and I want you to realize the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're disciplining you. In other words, we're breaking your bones of rebellion with a soft tongue, a loving tongue, which is more powerful than the tongue of a lion. So, Some of the Proverbs are pretty easy to understand. 
verse 16 says, If you have found honey, eat only enough for you. Why? Well, the next line explains it. Lest you have your fill of it and vomit it. So here is God's advice. In today's society, many people are overweight. And therefore, if you go to your doctor, he will tell you to eat in moderation. That's all that verse 16 is saying. God is saying, when you find honey, when you buy honey, I mean, it's really delicious. It's sweet to the tongue, etc. But if you take more than you are supposed to, if you don't eat in moderation, you will have your fill of it and vomit it. See, Proverbs is simply practical advice from God to watch out how you live your life. Verse 17, let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house. Now, what is that talking about? You may have a neighbor who at times welcomes you into his or her house as a visit. But then listen to the last part of verse 17. Let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he have his fill of you and hate you. You see, if you overdo your welcome, in fact, we often have English phrases that are taken from the book of Proverbs. And the one that comes to mind here is don't wear out your welcome. You know, you may have relatives that you enjoy seeing occasionally, maybe Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, but you don't want them over at your house every day because guess what? They will have their fill of you and hate you. Just like eating too much honey, you have your fill of it and vomit it. So again, practical advice from God. Don't wear out your welcome. Verse 18. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. Now, what's God saying here? He's taking the metaphors from war. And he's saying, if you bear false witness against your neighbor, what commandment are you breaking? That's the eighth commandment. And when your neighbor hears this false witness, it hits him like a war club, like a sword, like a sharp arrow. How many times has someone heard you say something about them that is not true? And boy, you've lost their friendship. And the reason you've lost their sh friendship is in bearing false witness against your neighbor is like hitting them with a war club, striking them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. This is God's way of explaining to us the danger of breaking the commandments. You can kind of do this with all the commandments. Like if you rebel against your parents, that is a way in which you're rebelling against God himself. 
because God puts your parents in charge of your life for a period of time. And therefore, if you bear false witness against your children, they are hurt by what you have to say. Verse 19 brings in another metaphor. Trusting in a treacherous man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. What's God saying here? Well, I do not like going to the dentist. Who does? Even for a cleaning, they have a new way of cleaning where they're using a, appears to me a sharp instrument to clean out the cavities if there are any, etc. And sometimes it's painful. Or what does it mean, a foot that slips? How many times do we pastors go to the hospital to visit a member whose foot slipped, fell down the stairs, maybe broke their leg, and they're in the hospital? That's as though you trusted in a treacherous man in time of trouble. Now, another way of saying trouble is in time of crisis. So you need to be very careful from whom you get advice when you're in a time of crisis. If it's a treacherous man, he's really thinking out for himself and not thinking of your interests. As the book of Philippians says, yes, take into account your own interests, but more importantly, deal with the interests of others. A treacherous man is a man who wants to give you advice to help himself out. And that is like having a bad tooth or a foot that slips and results in a broken bone. Verse 20, whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. Now, I have never had vinegar on soda. So I looked up the Hebrew word, and that's like having a drink and putting in it sodium bicarbonate. Now, that's not make your liquid tasty at all. In fact, every now and then the doctor may advise you, well, drink water, but at least once a day, add this element to the water. And when you add it, it may be a powder, it's to help you in your illness, and it doesn't make the water taste good. Why is that like singing songs to a heavy heart? Well, what is a heavy heart? It's somebody who's in a time of crisis. They have either had a death in the family, a loss of their home, a loss of their employment, problems in the family, maybe with the neighbors. And what do you do? You take your guitar over to their house and sing them a song. No, that's like taking off a garment on a cold day. You just don't do that. You wear garments on cold days. You don't put sodium bicarbonate in your drink. In other words, when you're dealing with a problem with a person in a crisis, you need 
to do more to them than just sing a song to a heavy heart. Now that does remind me that King Saul would have depression every now and then, and he would have David play his instrument and sing a song. But you remember that didn't create a relationship with David because he still wanted to put him to death and try twice. And if it had not been for Jonathan, Saul's son, David might have been killed. So singing songs to a heavy heart is like taking a garment off on a cold day and putting sodium bicarbonate in your drink. In other words, a heavy heart needs more than that. What do they need? They need the comfort and counsel of God's word. When pastors go and visit a member in the hospital, we don't read poetry from somebody they've never heard. We use the poetry from the Bible, from the Psalms. And this is what lifts a heavy heart and gives them comfort. They may be really uncomfortable in the surgery that's being planned. They may be afraid they may even die. But the comfort is that God will be with them. And even if that takes place, they will be in heaven. Verse 21 is, again, good advice from God. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Now, why would God say that we are to feed and give liquid to an enemy? Well, Scripture interprets Scripture. That is really critical. So you need to look in the immediate context of the verse or maybe another part of the Bible because a lot of the Bible is explained. The New Testament does a lot of explanation for Old Testament passages. But in this case, the explanation is found in the very next verse. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink for you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. I just saw a movie. It was called Britannic. It was a sinking of a ship by German Nazis. And there was a spy on the ship and he was a Nazi. And a woman had been assigned to find out who that spy was. And they began to have such a close relationship that once she realized that he was the one that would be responsible for the sinking of the ship, he got caught in a water situation where he couldn't get out. And what she did, she jumped into the water and helped him escape. You see, he was very thankful to her. And the way the movie ended is that the both of them were in a boat, but only one of them could be saved. And he chose her to be saved and helped her with a rope get to another boat further away from the sinking ship while he was killed 
by the propellers of the ship. You see, her kindness to him led to heaping burning coals on his head. And his attitude changed towards her. And the Lord rewarded her. So this is a very important point that God is making. When you have an enemy, be kind to them. Remember, it's the summary of the second set of commandments. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And oftentimes, that will awaken your neighbor, who is your enemy, and understanding of the love you have from Jesus Christ. Verse 23, a lot of scholars argue about this one. It says, the north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue, angry looks. Now the problem with that verse is that in the day of Jesus, rain did not come from the north. It came from the west. So some scholars think, that that was just bad words used by Solomon. But no, what Solomon is saying, when you have a north wind, the farmer therefore looks forward to then getting the west wind, which will bring forth rain for the earth. In other words, it's, a future promise and a backbiting tongue, angry looks. Well, we know what that's talking about. You know, people who have backbiting tongues. In other words, they whisper about you. You hear what they say and it gives birth to angry looks on the part of others. We don't like people with backbiting tongues. So in other words, just as a north wind indicates that soon there will be a west wind, so also a biting backbiting tongue will result in angry looks from others. 24. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now this is really marriage advice. Remember, it is a husband as the head of the household shall stop that quarrel and get a faithful marriage to his wife. And so sometimes one would rather get on top of the roof all by himself than be with a quarrelsome wife. In The Honeymooners, uh, Jackie Gleason as Ralph Cramden makes a point that he's the boss of the house. And when he makes that point, he has an argument with his wife who says, nobody is boss. And he soon finds out that that's true. And therefore, living with a quarrelsome wife is not good. It needs to be changed. Verse 25, like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Now, if that isn't talking in Solomon's view about the good news, which is a translation for the word gospel, uh, the word gospel came to Rome 
from people who attended a Pentecost celebration. And that became really good news to them, like cold water to a thirsty soul. In contrast to that, verse 26, like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. We're tempted many a day by the wicked, namely Satan, our flesh, and our sin. And if we are righteous and we give into that, that is like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain from which nobody can drink. That's what God is talking about here. And then the last verse we're looking at, verse 27 of Proverbs 25. It is not good to eat much honey. See, that's going back to verse 16. If you eat too much honey, you will have your fill of it and vomit it. But then it continues in the last half of the verse. Nor is it glorious to seek one's glory. And we seek one's glory by boasting of our works rather than boasting of the works of Jesus Christ. Tremendous Verses from Proverbs, God's view of proper behavior. We'll continue with Law and Gospel on tomorrow's broadcast. God bless you. Listen to Law and Gospel each weekday morning at 930 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law and Gospel, please make your check out to Law and Gospel and mail to Law and Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.